Hey family, thank you so much for joining us here on our YouTube channel. We pray that this sermon touches your heart and changes your life, that you and I would all be conformed into the image of His Son, Jesus. And hey, if you wanna continue to see more word like this and help us get this message of truth, this message of Jesus out to a hurting world. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me. I wanna encourage you to be one of our truth partners. And you can do that by texting truth partner, one word, to 53555 today. And help us get this message of truth out to so many broken people, you and I and the whole world simply need Jesus. We love you. Thank you for being a truth partner. We'll see you back here on the channel real soon. Subscribe, ring that bell for future notifications. God bless you. So go with me to the book of 1 Kings. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read it all to you. But the book of 1 Kings 13 through 19, you can read it actually on your own. But they were building the temple and Solomon uh, was responsible, obviously, for building Solomon's temple. And it took seven and a half years, took 80,000 people just in the quarry, 120,000 people working uh, day and night for seven and a half years to build this temple. Master builders. And one of the master builders that they brought on to help build the columns out front of the temple was Huram. And Huram was a mighty man of faith. His mother was a woman of faith. His father was not a man of faith, but his father was a master builder. And he gave his son his gifts. And, but he, he got his faith from his mother. And so he told the Lord, he said, Lord, I'm going to give you this year. And I'm going to take this entire year and I'm going to give it to you and I'm going to use my gifts and my talents and my abilities to build the kingdom of God. I want to encourage all of you this year to use the gifts that God has given you to build his kingdom. And the kingdom is church, but it's, it's, it's more than church. The kingdom is 24-7. You're only in church a couple hours a week. I'm talking about using your gifts for the Lord every day. The gifts that God has given you, use, use them to rescue people from hell. Use them to be a voice of encouragement and love and healing to a broken world. Come on, can I get an amen about that? But he chose, he said, I'm going to use my gifts to build the kingdom of God. And he was in charge of the two pillars, the two pillars. And I'll read just one verse to you out of this. Um, put the last verse up there for me out of second, out of 1 Kings, 1 Kings verse 19 and it says the capitals which were on the top of the pillars in the hall were to be in the shape of lilies everybody say lilies of lilies now put a picture of the tabernacle up for me so this is a picture of the tabernacle and you see those two gold pillars in the front this is what he built this is what he was responsible for and they were they were made out of bronze and wrapped in gold and they were massively intricate. They were 34 and a half feet tall. Okay? But the thing that you can't see, all you can see when you look up is the pillars because you're on the ground. The thing that he built, that he didn't take just days and weeks and months, but took all of this time to build, was he built at the very top, and he placed it on the very top where nobody could see it because only the people at the bottom, they could just see the pillar from the ground up. But he put it on the very top was a lily. The very intricate gold lily. The lilies were to be at the top. This is how it was designed. That nobody could see it but the Lord. That as the people looked up, they saw the strength. I mean, these were huge columns. They even had names. One meant, one of the columns' names was, God, is my, God will establish his strength amongst the people. That was one of the names of the column. But only God saw the lily. Only God saw the lily. That you ought to have some things you're building in your life that are only for Jesus. This is what fasting and prayer is. 
Fasting and prayer gives you a hunger for the things people cannot see. Some of us only want to do things for Jesus as long as people can see it. We want to be a part of the kingdom as long as people can see it. And I'm not saying there's not a place for people to see and celebrate what God's done in you and celebrate how God uses your gifts. I'm not saying there's not a place for it. I'm just saying there's got to be something in your heart and in your life that is only between you and Jesus. This is what prayer and fasting is. People don't post pictures of them fasting. They don't post pictures of them praying. If you've ever seen somebody on it, no one's ever in the presence of God and on Instagram. Because when you go in the presence of God, you go by yourself. I'm not attacking those things and saying you can't be on. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, I'm saying that when you go in the presence of the Lord, you go alone. And there has to be something in your life that you build between you and the Lord. I told you before, you ought to have some things that God tells you in secret that you write in a journal that your kids read about you when you die. That you ought not post everything that you ought not tell everything. Some of us want to do our best prayers in public. Maybe your best prayers should be in private. Maybe your best worship, no one hears the Jesus. Maybe there's things that you do for the Lord that only the Lord knows. This is what the Bible says, when man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. That I can see all of you, but I cannot see your hearts. Only Jesus can see your hearts. This is the challenge that the Lord took with worship. He said, many of you sing. He said, you praise me with your mouth, but your heart is far from me. That every time you sing, God is not just listening at the words that come out of your mouth, but he's looking at the posture of your heart. Is your heart close to Jesus? Is your heart for him? Do you burn with one desire? him the lord and we can look strong like these pillars we can look wonderful and glittery and shiny but where is the lily would god see a lily in your life would god see that part of prayer would god see that part that nobody sees yeah man they sound good oh wow they preach good oh wow look at them they're amazing but is there that lily in their life because like the the pillar like the pillar as wonderful as it is the lily is the prayer it is the fasting that we give to Jesus can somebody say amen this is the heart of God for his people that we wouldn't just look good on the outside but we would have a genuine relationship with Jesus on the inside that nobody could see but you and the Lord. And it took months, months. How many people are willing to work on something? Imagine going and creating something. I had um, a gentleman with me today, walking with me, he was an artist. And I said, imagine building something, a a painting or a rendering, and you spend months on it, and you made it for no one to see but Jesus. Imagine writing a song that you only sang for the Lord. You never wrote it to go on YouTube. You never wrote it for the people to have it. You never wrote, you only wrote it for Jesus. Imagine that. Imagine a sermon that you only preached when you got in the presence of the Lord. These are the I love you notes. This is where your heart burns in a relationship for him. Taking a portion of your, your, your paycheck this year, not, I'm not talking about tithing, I'm talking about above tithing, to put aside, to say, this is a part of my paycheck that I'm putting in an account for ministry, that if God tells me to go here, do this, give this, fly here, do that, I'm going to do it. And nobody knows but Jesus. I'm not posting about it, I'm not talking about it. It's just the, the, the beauty is in the secrecy. This is why Jesus, this, this is how Jesus said, he said, when you pray, not if, but when you pray, go into your closet 
and shut the door. And your father who is in secret hears you pray. So the implication is that God lives in secrecy. He lives in secret. We want to be, we want to live in public. I remember when social media came out. My dad was just like, why in the world would anybody ever tell people what they're doing? Why would anybody ever, why would, why would somebody tell publicly their private life? Just from, we couldn't fathom. Now, because we, now we live in a world where everything is public. And he says, the father who lives in, your father lives in secrecy. God lives in secrecy, not social media. Secrecy. Go into your secret place. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall. I just read you out a psalm. He says, I came down from my secret place and met with you. Psalms 81. The secrecy. I told you before how Sam said you, you, you can destroy the plan of God for your life telling your secrets. That's how Samson lost it. He told Delilah his secret. Something that God gave him that he was to tell no one. The lily that only God sees. Do you have something you're building with Jesus that only Jesus sees? Are we teaching our children to value the secret relationship with Jesus? Are we teaching them everything about God is public? Everything about God is for the masses. Everything about God. The genuineness of the relationship is in the secrecy. I mean, imagine, just think of the love in this, that they would build this, that they would build, it was like we built this building. It was like if we built this building and there was this one part on the building that we gave to the Lord and nobody knew about it. But the Lord. Do you see, you see how our flesh wars to be, to tell, to be known, to be celebrated, to magnify ourselves? Oh, look what I did. I got to tell everybody. Like, that's our flesh. But, but the Lord is in the opposite of that. The Lord is in the secrecy. He says, your father who sees in secret, will, I'll reward you publicly. Samson was used publicly. He was, he was a judge of a nation because he had a secret. And when he gave up his secret, he lost it all. The father had rewarded him publicly because of the secret. We give up the secret and we, we, we think giving up the secret will cause us to have the influence. The secret is the influence. Because then the influence comes from God and not you. This is all a part of God untangling this out of us. Because our need to be known, our need to be accepted, our need to be famous, or all of this is, is our flesh. All of this comes out of self-loathing, self-pity, pain, rejection that we face as children. All of this is demonic. It's not like Jesus. The Bible says Jesus made of himself no reputation. They couldn't pick him out of 12 people. That is the complete opposite of our world. Because we don't trust the Lord to do it, so we need to get involved. This is why we don't forgive people. Because we don't trust the Lord to discipline people, so we got to get involved. But when you yield and you surrender, this is how you live the life of victory, is surrender. I was just teaching on parenting. I was in Atlanta on Wednesday preaching on parenting. And people always ask me the question, how do you balance eight kids and everything you got going on? How do you do it? I said, I don't balance. We do not balance. We yield. We surrender. That's the only way to make it work is everybody has to die. And then let Christ live in us. 
is the only way our home functions. Balance is when people are trying to take the reins and they're trying to make it work. And you'll feel, you'll feel the tension. Oh, we're trying to balance. Oh, we're doing too far. Oh, hold on. Hold on. We're trying to, we're trying to, and this is a person trying to balance. Marriage, kids, money, school. Trying, oh, oh, we're trying to, and you stressed out. Frustrated. Because you, you try, you trying to balance. You have to let go. You have to die. This is our symbol. This is our symbol. This is the symbol. This is the most known symbol on earth. It's the cross. This is where people die. And you yield and you let Christ live through you. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live in the life that I live in the flesh. I live by faith of the Son of God who died and gave himself for me. Luke chapter 12, verse 27. This is Jesus. How many of you believe the words of Jesus? He says, consider the what? Consider the lilies, how they grow, how they neither toil nor spin. See, there's the people who are trying to balance. Toil, spin, work hard. I got to make it. No, 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 no. You yield. Yield. This is what Jesus said. Consider the lilies. Why did he tell you to consider the lily? Because he knew about the lilies. He knew about the lilies. He knew about the secret. Look what he even, he even references it. He says, consider the lilies, how they grow, how they neither toil nor spit. And yet I say unto you, even Solomon, he brings up Solomon still, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. What's he talking about? The lily. He's talking about the lily. In Solomon's temple, he's saying, it's about yielding. It's about the secret. It's about you and me. It's not about you and trying hard. It's about surrender, yield. Well, how do I do it, Jesus? I modeled it for you. Jesus died to show us how to die. He showed us how to die. He showed us how to go to the cross. Isaiah prophesies it before. He says he goes, he's acted like he doesn't know where he's going. Like a sheep to the slaughter, yet he opened not his mouth. We don't go complaining, fighting, yelling, cussing out everybody. No, 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 no. We don't, we don't die like that. Jesus died singing. Do you know that? Many people don't know that. You, anybody ever heard Jesus say, um, uh, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, and um, it is finished. How many people know? That's a psalm. He was singing while dying. The singing Savior. Nails going in his hands and feet, and he's singing. This is how we die. We glory in the wounds. We glory in our sufferings. And when the church learns to glory in its sufferings, it is undefeatable. You cannot defeat somebody who glories in pain. <laughs> you can only defeat somebody who glories in success. Because then you touch their success. Wow. How do you glory? How do you destroy someone who glories in their crawl? Count it all joy when we face persecution. It is good that we have been afflicted. This is the church. This is the early church talked like this. The early church didn't talk about eight ways of success. How to have balance in Jesus. How to, this is this is the this is the I don't know what this is, but the church today would get a letter from Paul. <laughs> I'm talking to you about how to live a victorious life, and when you're 60, you're standing; 80, you're standing. Consider the lilies. 
And then Joel, let's, let's end with this. Let's go to Joel. Because y'all got one less good lunch. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. It says, Now therefore, verse 12, Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, Turn to me, everybody say, Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting. You see it? Turn to me with all your heart. What's the first thing you should turn? Fasting. With weeping. With mourning. See, you ain't mourning yet. Wait till Tuesday. It's going to get real. It's going to get real real quick. With mourning, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. So rend your hearts, rip your hearts, not your garments. Rip your hearts. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him? You know what they say? They're saying, look, if we will repent, maybe God won't have to discipline us and take us through everything he was going to take us through. And maybe, maybe instead of him whooping us and judging us, he'll change his mind. And who's to say he won't leave a blessing? If he sees our heart change. How many of you ever gotten ready to have a come to Jesus meeting with one of your kids? And, and, and what you were after, you didn't want to do that. All you were after was their heart shift. Joanna and I, when we discipline, if I tell the kids, look, if you don't, if you don't behave, then this is going to happen. And that may be, well, you, this is going to happen to you. You're going you're gonna to do the dishes for the next two weeks. Well, if their heart shifts, if I get a heart shift, I won't make them do it. I don't make them live out the sentence if the heart shifts. I'll only make you live out the sentence if your heart doesn't shift. This is what God is saying. If your heart shifts, I won't make you have to live out or take you through everything I got to take you through. See, because God's a good dad. He's a good dad. He will discipline you. How many of you know if you were disciplined, now you look back and go, I'm thankful I was disciplined because I know my parents love me. Come on, can I get an amen about that? I'm not talking about abusing anybody or anything like that. I'm talking about just godly discipline, okay? You realize I was thankful that I was disciplined. This is how the Lord is. The Lord, the, God is such a good dad. He will deal with you. He will... Jonah, I don't care if those other kids are going to Tarshish. They can go. God didn't have a problem with them going. But if you get on that boat, if you get on that boat, after I already told you not to, I will call a whirlwind to come get you. Because you are my child. Do you understand? You are mine. For the kingdom of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. That's the word. He knows those, those are those that are his kids. He knows them. That's why some of y'all can't get away with nothing. Your friends get away with it. People get away with it. You say, here I go one time and yep, because you're his child. You ain't no good at sinning. Every time you do it, you mess up. Every time you do it, you get in trouble. So quit. God don't want you doing it. You're not good at it. Some of the young people just need to stop it. Quit trying. Even, you know how you know? <laughs> you know, you know one of the ways you know? The world rejects you. They go, we don't want to get high with you. We don't like, hey, you, and then you try and be even more bad. And the more you try and be like them, the more they reject you. One, because you got a mama who's got the Holy Ghost, who's praying for you. So you don't stand a chance. So you might as well just surrender. You are terrible at lying. You, the world doesn't even like to drink with you. You're like, they don't, why are they my friends? Because you belong to Jesus. How come they don't ever call me to hang out and go to the club? 
because you belong to the Lord. And then she don't like you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. He's madly in love with you, and he's jealous. And he's going to sabotage every attack of the enemy because you're his child. He will sabotage it. I pray that over my kids. Sabotage it. Sabotage it. Booby trap it, Warden. Any girl that you don't want in their life, sabotage it. Booby trap it. Strike them with blindness. Do whatever you got to do, Lord. Keep sin far from them. Let them hate the taste of alcohol all the days of their life. So I don't ever have to get them out of, out of, out of jail because they drunk. I don't have to go to the court with them because of DUIs. I don't have to let them hate the taste of it. Make them throw up because of it. Do whatever you got to do. Let them hate the taste of drugs and marijuana. Don't, don't, let them, let them, don't ever let them feel comfortable around the wrong people. Let them feel like they got just, just something climbing up their back when they get around the wrong people. Don't ever let them develop a taste for the things that are not of Jesus. what you got to pray over them and plead the blood of Jesus over them. Cover them in prayer. Soak them in the blood of the Lord. Prophesy greatness and destiny over them all the days of their life. All I do is hear it. All I do is hear. Yeah, morning, noon, and night. You're somebody. You're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath. You're a daughter of the king. Everything about you is perfect. From the color of your skin to the texture of your hair, you are fearfully, marvelously made. Nobody can do what you can do like you can do it. You are called and anointed for such a time as this. Speak that over their life. Write it on their hearts where they may not like it, but you're going to know it. You may not like it, you may not agree with it, but you're going to know it. And one day you're going to look back and say, I'm glad I had a mama, I'm glad I had a daddy that stood in the gap for me. This is what our children need. This is what God is for you. God will fight for you. God will come through 40 and two generations and rescue you. That's what he said in Psalms 81. He says, I came from my secret place when I heard your cry and I rescued you. I rescued you. But I put a new song in your heart. These are the things that only Jesus does. Only Jesus can do this. And this is what he says in Joel. If we will fast and pray, these are all promises that come if we fast and pray. He says, rend your hearts for me in verse 13. Return to the Lord. He will leave you a blessing. Verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Do you see that? That's what you see your pastors and church leaders doing. We are consecrating a fast. And then he says, call a sacred assembly. That's what we're doing tonight at 430. We've called a sacred assembly. We've done it every morning for 21 days at 6 a.m. We're calling a sacred assembly assembly. Anytime you hear your pastor say this is a sacred assembly, this is an assembly for prayer. This is an assembly solely for Jesus. It's called a sacred assembly. So you see us living the word of God, consecrated fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people. That's my command from the Lord to gather you. Sanctify the congregation. It means to set you apart and to set you aside for the use of the king. Assemble the elders, all of our leaders and staff will be here. Gather the children, the nursing babies, and let the bridegroom come from his chambers and let the bride from her dressing room. Let the priest and the ministers minister to the Lord. Let the priest who minister to who? We don't minister to you. We minister to the Lord. When, when we sing, we sing to Jesus. When we pray, when we minister, we're ministering to the Lord. This is why if you flip it and you try to minister to the people, then you start to do everything for the people. Do short services because that's what the people like. Don't do long worship because that's what the people like. Don't talk about anything controversial because that's what the people like. Don't do anything because the people, the people, the people, the people, the people. This is what happened with Saul when he fell into sin. And the, and the prophet came to him and he said, when you were little in your own eyes and all this kind of stuff. And he said, oh, he said he was concerned about what the people would think more than he was concerned about what God would think.
that the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. You know, I, pre I pastored for 20 years, and only this last year have I pastored where I feel like I cannot almost get up here without weeping every Sunday. Because the closer you get to him, he, he just breaks the outer man. And when he breaks the outer man, you cannot control how it comes out. And I'm not ashamed for weeping when the Lord's word tells me that priests should weep. Why? Because they've been with Jesus. They've been with Jesus. Let them say, spare the people. Do not give, Lord. So then Andrew and I and the ministers, we come before God and say, God, forgive the people. God, bless the people. God, don't let what they've done, don't hold it against them. God, do this in their life. This is the word here in Joel. Don't let the nations rule over them. Verse 18, then the Lord will be zealous in his land and have pity on his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil. Somebody say amen about that. And I will sanctify and you will, you will be sanctified by them and will no longer make you a reproach of many nations. Then skip down to verse 4, 24. The threshing floor shall be full of wheat and the vat shall overflow with new, with new wine and oil. So I will restore unto you the years. My God, this is a promise to people who fast and pray. God says, I will give you years. How many people lost some years? I know I have lost years. How many people have lost some years with mistakes you made in life? Fighting people when you should have fought the enemy. Years feeling sorry for yourself. Years of self, self pity and self loathing and, and denial and fear. Years you lost in fear. Fear of failure, fear of rejection. God says, if you fast and pray, I will restore the years. The years. Nothing's more valuable to you than time. As a pastor, I'm with people when they die. They're rich, poor. I don't care what their skin tone is. I don't care what ethnicity they is. I don't care how much money they got. Nobody can write a check and get a second. Nobody. And God says, I will give you the most valuable thing that I can give you. I will give you years. Years that the palm worm, the canker worm, the locust ate up. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise my name. And the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people, you shall never be put to shame. Never. If you've got shame in your heart, you need to fast and pray and God will deliver you from shame. And then you shall know that I am the Lord in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God. And there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. And the last promise, and it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Hallelujah. How many of you want your sons and daughters to prophesy? In order to prophesy, they got to see Jesus. This is the last day language of the Holy Spirit. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Go to the next verse for me. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And all my handmaidens, my servants, that will pour out on my spirit. This is the heart of Jesus. When a church fasts and pray, this has nothing to do with the organization. This is the church. We're talking about you and Jesus in the morning. You and Jesus at night. Somebody bring me my phone. Oh, it's a, no, I don't have it. Somebody bring me my phone, please. I wanna, I wanna read something to you before I, we go. You and Jesus. There was um, a study done for a young man 
and young women from 20 to 40. Most young men are focused on making a brand, making a name, making a certain amount of money. They're trying to get somewhere. They're trying to accomplish something. A lot of stress, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. Most women from 20 to 40 are not focused on that. They're focused on um, character development. Thank you so much. They're focused on character development. They're focused on the children. They're focused on the marriage, the family from 20 to 40. It flips at 40, the study said. And now most women, the kids are kind of more grown. They're getting ready to leave the house, go to college. They've spent 20 years focused on character development. They're ready to be CEOs. Most men now at 40 have realized money's not everything. Lots of them have lost their marriages. And many of them, by the time it dawns on them, their children are now grown, heading off to college, and it's too late to repair. This is the study. And this study is from the New England Journal of Medicine. And I just bring this up to you because it says, an average study in the United States found that the most productive, successful financial years in a human life is between 60 to 70 years of age. The second most productive stage of human life is 70 to 80. That's the second. The third most productive years of human life are 50 to 60 years of age. The average age of um, Nobel Peace Prize winners is 62. The average age of most presidents and prominent CEOs of companies in the world is 63. The average age of the pastors of the hundreds largest churches in America is 71. Most popes are 76. This tells us in a way, and it has been determined that the best years of human life and most productive years of human life are between 60 to 80 years of age. You're going to make the most money you've ever made in your life between 60 to 80. So why? Are you choosing to not put God first, not invest in your marriage, not invest in your children, not invest in who you are becoming with Jesus? Between 20 to 40, if you're not doing that, you're selling that for the least money you'll ever make. You are selling your birthright for a bowl of soup. These are the year to focus on your marriage, to focus on parenting, to focus on who you are becoming in Jesus. This is the least you'll ever make. This is it. So seize the moment. Build the lilies that only God sees. Invest, investing in your children are the lilies. God doesn't, only God sees when I pray with him. And it's a lot with that age group. I'm in little kids, big kids, junior high, senior high. I got to commu communicate Jesus to all these age groups. It's very difficult. And then to y'all. But they're the greatest investment of your life. Have something this year that you build for Jesus. Only Jesus. Can I get an amen about that? Amen. Did you get something out of this today? Did the Lord touch your heart? Hey, I know that this sermon blessed your heart. I hope it's been an encouragement to you to become more like Jesus. That's our heart and that's our prayer. He's the X on the treasure map. He is the topic of heaven. Everything is all about Jesus. And I want to encourage you, get up in the morning, spend time with him, pray, seek his heart, seek his face, and uh, see what he will do in your life. Before you go, I want to ask you to prayerfully consider being a truth partner. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, it reminds me of Aquila and Priscilla, who would, sh who would help the Apostle Paul spread the message of truth. A couple, a married couple, 
uh, you know, would just invest to spread the message of truth to so many hurting people. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He is truth. And you can be a truth partner today by simply texting truth partner, one word, to 53555. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe to the channel, click that little bell for notifications. But thank you for your generosity. So many of you give online, you give throughout the week, all over the nation. And I just wanna say thank you so much. We're using this resource to continue to get this message of truth out to so many broken and hurting people. And uh, we wanna be a blessing to you. And so let us know how we can pray for you. You know, comment below. There's a lot of resources on uh, my website uh, that are available to you. But we want you to know how much we love you. Thank you for partnering with us. Thank you for being a truth partner. We'll see you back here on the channel real soon.